2 Thessalonians chapter number 1, you can begin reading in verse number 3. The Bible says, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is me, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you, in the churches of God, for your patience and faith, in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. Now, in this passage, the Apostle Paul, Second Thessalonians, very well known for chapter number 2, which is where the Apostle Paul starts correcting some things that we heard our pastor preach on on Wednesday night. That would be the second coming of the Lord. There were people in the days of Paul that were preaching that Jesus had already come back, that he is about ready to come back, or that when he did come back, those that were alive would prevent those that had died, even though they were saved, but would prevent those that had already died from being resurrected with Christ. A bunch of hogwash, all of it, but chapter number 2 of the book of 1 Thessalonians deals with the timing of all of that. And basically, to sum it up, he, he being the Apostle Paul, said, uh, until the Antichrist come, ain't nothing going to happen. And then he says, Antichrist isn't going to show up because of the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost has got to go away before the Antichrist could show up. So, anyway, that's chapter number two. Most people associate Second Thessalonians with that. But in chapter number one, he hadn't even got to teaching yet. He's still in his salutation in chapter number one. He's saying, hey, just want to let y'all know that we love you. Want to let you know that we're proud of you know, how you're growing in the Lord. That's what verse number three is. We're bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because your faith groweth exceedingly. He says, you're continuing to grow in faith and the nurture and admonition of the Savior. He says, you know more now than you did when I left. And he says, hallelujah. Okay, then he goes on to say, and the charity of every one of you, of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. Now, if you've heard me or anybody else usually teach on the word charity in the New Testament, Charity, by definition, is love. Okay, the Apostle Paul also wrote, if I have not charity, right, he says he has nothing. Doesn't matter how good of a preacher he is. Doesn't matter how good at witnessing to people he is. Doesn't matter how good of a teacher he is. If everything that he does for the Lord is not based out of love, then he has become worthless. Because how did Christ bring the message of salvation to us? Through love. Why did God send Christ? For God so loved the world. Right? Love is the center point of, who, of what God does because God is love. It's who he is. So if we as his disciples have not love, right, essentially we're hypocrites. He says, if you teach about the one who is altogether lovely, who has loved you with an everlasting love, who said that because he loves you so much, he'll never leave you nor forsake you, he says, but if that's your Savior and you don't have any love, he says, it's hard for the world to recognize that you're associated with Jesus because Jesus is love. His disciples should have love in their life. What's the first fruit of the Spirit? Love. If you get hooked up with the one that is love, love's going to start showing up in your life. Right? By association. So... He says, we're very proud of the fact that your charity towards one another, and he, does, he says that your love to each other, all of y'all, is basically what said. There's two different types of y'all, if some of y'all ain't from the South today. Right? There's y'all, which is everybody, or it could be a group of people. I could be saying, hey, y'all over here, and then I could say all y'all, and that's everybody in the room. Right? That's the plural of y'all, is all y'all. Okay. Yeah, see, it makes sense to Ed. But what he's saying is your love, talking personally to all of you in the church, he says it groweth 
exceed it aboundeth means you can't contain it it just flows over that's how quick it's growing right it's like the rabbits had a you know celebration one week and then you're running out of room in the rabbit coop stuff hold all the right you just it's abounding you can't contain it he says your love for one it's spilling out of the church and affecting the community because you've embraced the love of God so much in your life he says you can't contain it but more importantly what he said is the devil can't contain it right the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of the living God you want to know the one thing that the devil can't duplicate can't well he can try and replicate everything but it's always a fraud but the one thing he's never been able to get down is love because true love is what it's charity it's giving of yourself to another with no expectation of return for no other reason than the fact that you appreciate them for whatever reason you value that person and because you value them so much you want to take part of you and invest it in them it is sacrificial true charity is not based upon what you do it's based on why you do it everything that the devil does is based on results it's on the impact it's what you get if you invest you expect a return not with charity with charity you give with no strings attached True love is giving of yourself because you know it's what's best for the other person. It's not a matter of well, what's it going to cost me. It's a matter of what does that person need. And the devil's not about giving to others. What's he of it? He's a liar and the father of it. The thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy. He's all about reaping unto himself what he thinks he deserves. That's why the wages of sin is what? Death. It's going to cost you everything you've got. But love, on the other hand, giveth life. Now there's intimacy, there's attraction, there's a whole bunch that the world can try to do to tell you that it's love, but true love cannot be imitated. And when people see it, they know that it's real. Why do you think that the apostle, or that James wrote in his epistle, that's what I meant to say, that he would prove to you his faith by his works. True love doesn't have to be proven because you prove it every day with your actions. If you show charity towards another, in the truest sense of the word, sacrificially giving because it's what they deserve, it may not even be what they deserve, it's what they need. Doesn't matter what it costs you in order to give them what it is that they need, you do it out of love. You don't have to tell somebody that you love them, they know. It's evident. Right? When you found out all that God did for you, somebody didn't have to convince you that God loved you. You understood, God loves me. He sent his son. You find out what Jesus endured on earth, which we're going to get to here in a minute. You understand that Jesus loved you. And he endured it all, not for himself, but for you. Because it was what you needed. It wasn't about what he had to go through. It was about what you needed and how much he loved you. But that's charity. So why wouldn't the Apostle Paul be? He says, we thank God always as it is me. In other words, it's a good thing for me to thank God for y'all. Because you have embraced what it is to be Christ-like. He says, you are continuing to grow and become more Christ-like through the guidance of the Holy Ghost. And he says, but you've taken to it so much it can't be contained. You can't put a bottle cap on what's going on down there. God's just flowing through the church and it's reaching out into the community. Okay, well, verse number four. So that we ourselves, referring to Paul, Silvanius, and Timotheus, who wrote this, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God, for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. So he says that we ourselves glory in you. Well, first, here's a little tiny, tiny picture okay, of the corporate or the business side of the church. Okay, the church is made up of what? Individuals. He says we glory in you individually. 
We're glad that you got saved, and we're glad that you're growing, and that you're becoming a not only more mature Christian, but a more active and participating Christian. That you're getting involved in the ministry. We're, we glory in you. But then he says, we glory in you in the churches. Right? Nothing ever is going to get done outside of God's game plan. Well, what's God's game plan? God uses local, called out, New Testament, Bible-believing churches as his corporation on earth. If it goes outside of the church, God's not in it. Because God always uses the church. So he says, we glory in you. We're, we're glad for you. We're also glad collectively in your bodies of Christ. Each church is a body that God has assembled to do in that community what God intends them to do. He says, we're thankful for you individually. We're also thankful for you collectively. He says, we're thankful for every church. Because we know that every church is just made up of a whole bunch of individuals. You know what makes the church special? It's not the people that's a part of it. It's who founded it. The thing that makes the church special is that the one that's calling all the shots, he's been known to take little and make a lot out of it. He's been known to use the base things that confound the wise. He's known to take those situations that seem impossible and make them very possible. Right? The thing that makes the church special is who put the church together. And why did Jesus put the church together? Well, Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. He paid the price for the church, which was his blood. But why did he pay the price? Because he loved it. So again, you see an individual love of charity, individual responsibility on becoming participants in the ministry, but then he says, in the churches. Then we see the corporate, and then we see the ownership. He says, we glory in you, in the churches of God. He says, we don't glory in the fact that God let us come by your way one day and preach to you, and that's why the church is so great. No, he says, we glory in you because you've embraced and adopted what Christ intended you as a child of God to embrace. We're glad that you're where God can use you, which is the place that God started just for you to be a member of the body of Christ. He says, but we glory in you in the churches of God. He says, it's not the church of Paul, it's the church of God. You know who owns that church? It's not the pastor. It's God. You know who makes the decisions in the treasury? It's not the treasurer, it's God. You know who dictates what kind of lessons get taught in the children's Sunday school room or in the teen classroom or in the adult classroom? It's not a program and it's not a booklet, it's God. You want to know why we use the Bible that we use? Because it's the only one that God wrote. You want to know why we live the way that we do? It's because that's the way God said to live. It's not about ego, and it's not about my emotions. This is the house that God paid for. And if anybody gets the glory, as much as we thank God for you, we know that you're made of the same stuff that we are. The Apostle Paul called himself chiefest of sinners. In fact, he wrote, O wretched man that I am. Doesn't sound like he's a big fan of himself. Because he knows all the intimate and personal details of what he wrestles with every day. Everybody else looked on the outside and saw the man of God that God was doing great things for. I mean, essentially, he went to every part of the known world at that time and preached what he used to persecute against. And God used him mightily. Not because of who he was, but because of his faithfulness, his obedience. Because God met him on the road to Damascus one day and said, I'm going to use you to make an apostle to the Gentiles. And he said, okay. Oh, okay. First he had to make his way down to Damascus to, you know, because God blinded him for a little bit. He had to go get his eyesight back. But after that, he went back and his story changed to what it was for the rest of his life. I met Jesus one day and that made all the difference. But the apostle Paul knew there's nothing special about me as a person. Outside of God, there's nothing special about any of us. 
We're all unique, but we're all made out of the same stuff. It's dirt. The only reason we're all kicking each and every day is because God breathed into man the breath of life, and he hadn't shut the oxygen off yet. The only reason I have the ability to get out of the bed each morning is not because I took all my vitamins yesterday, right, or I got enough sleep. The Bible says because he created everything by him and through him do all things consist. You know what that means? Without him, every second and millisecond of every part of eternity, if he isn't solely fo you know, focused on I want that or permit it to happen, it don't happen. If Jesus took half a second off, everything would spin out of the way that he created it. Because by him and through him do all things consist. If the devil would have won and would have actually killed Jesus, all of creation would have ended. But he should have known better. He only spent who knows how long in heaven praising him and worshiping him as the minister of music in heaven. He should have known that without him none of this works. So when he went into the ground and things weren't over, man, he wasn't dead. He laid down his life and he was getting ready to take it up again. Now, those things just make sense when you think about them. When the Creator, if He di ever died, the creation would cease to exist. Right? The reason that light bulbs work are not because the light bulb was made correctly, it's because the electricity is still running through it. Right? If the light bulb burns out, but we know there's still electricity, we can get another light bulb. But if electricity stops, it doesn't matter how many light bulbs you got, they're not going to work. Don't know how we got off on all that, but you're welcome. That wasn't in the notes. Yeah, but, he says, we praise, we praise the Lord for you individually. Why is it important to thank God for people in your life that he's using to make an impact on you? Because that person was important enough to God that he sent his only begotten son for. God thinks a lot of that person. God thinks a lot of you. Even though we don't understand it. But, God thought enough of you to send that person into your life. He thought enough of that other person to know that they can accomplish what God wants them to accomplish in your life. We ought to take time, step back, say, Lord, I thank you for sending that person by my way. I thank you for giving me that person as a friend. Lord, I thank you for this person who's shared some of their wisdom and some of their guidance that you've instilled in them to help me in my life. Not because they're anything special, but Lord, I thank you for what you use them to do. And I thank you that you have that obedient servant, and I pray they be richly rewarded. Now, he said, for you, then the church, without the church, none of us be here today. Right? Why did we get saved? Because there was a church somewhere that sent somebody by your way. Why did that church exist? Well, according to doctrine in the Bible it takes a church to birth a church you just can't start one one day you gotta be hooked up to the same wagon that Jesus started what did Jesus do? he started the church very early on in his ministry they paid for it on Calvary but from that day you know what happens? the church that he started went out and started another church started another church started another church and if we go all the way back we believe that because we're founded on the same doctrines that he taught and preached that we can trace ourselves all the way back to Jesus. That's real hard for the Catholics to do when they say Peter was the first pope and the church was founded 400 years after he's dead. Right? It's real hard for a lot of religions to go all the way back. To, they can go back to a point where they made a change to make themselves different, but we can go all the way back to Christ. But church is very important. It's, as we've already said, God's corporation, God's economy here on earth, everything that he does goes through the church. And of course, we praise God to God be the glory, great things they have done. We just sang it. Of course, the one that did it all gets the glory. But he says, we thank God for all of you, not just because of what we said in verse number three. He says, for your patience and faith in all of your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. The Apostle Paul says, not only are you doing what we said in verse number 3, where you've got that charity, where your faith groweth. 
He says, we understand that you've done it through very tough times. He says, tribulations and persecutions. Now, if you're like me, you just believe that if God wrote down two different words, that he meant two different things by each word. We group those together a lot. Trials and tribulations, or persecutions and tribulations. Really been going through a trial. Well, to God, they're two different things. A persecution is somebody trying to stop you from believing what you believe. In the simplest definition. Most of the time, we think we experience persecution. Somebody's opinion is not persecution. Somebody telling you what it is they think about you, that's not persecution. Persecution's when they show up with weapons at the door and say, you go in here and try to worship, we're going to kill you. Or if you go out and preach again, we're going to throw you in prison. If we catch you with the track, doesn't matter if you're handing it out. If one falls out of your pocket, we're going to take you down to the federal prison. That's persecution. In fact, there's a great book. It's called The Trail of the Blood. And it talks about the persecution from Jesus all the way up to what it takes. Well, the book's pretty old now. But up until that time, all those that had died a martyr's death so that you could sit in a church house today and hear what Jesus taught some 2,000 years ago. A lot of people have paid a great price. Not monetarily. But not talking about their time. They laid down their life for Christ so that the thing that we get to do as oft as we want to right? they paid for it with their lives so that you could have the freedom to do it right? that's persecution persecution is when the, you feel like the whole world is trying to get you to shut up and never speak the name Jesus again it's so when the world will change the rules so that they can do whatever they want to to you just so that you don't talk about Jesus anymore. But that's persecution. Most of us, we don't know persecution. Most of us know tribulation. Right? But again, that's a word that we hear a lot. Tribulation, by definition, is something so hard that it leaves an impact on you. Okay, tribulation doesn't have to come from outside. It can come from inside. But tribulation is a weight that's so great that it's not easily borne. Right? If God gives you a burden, you can carry that weight. I'm not saying it's not going to get heavy sometimes. But if God gives you the burden, He knows you're able to carry it. A tribulation is... You're finding out what your breaking point is. It's heavier than you think you can carry. But again, God being God doesn't allow a tribulation to come into your life that he knows is too much for you. God knows it's not too much for me, but guess who doesn't know that it's not too much for me? Me. A tribulation is a hardness to show me what I am capable of. It can be something benign it may not be any ill will to it right I just thinking about it makes me angry okay but I remember back in the days when I was in shape and played football I hated running with a passion right I would preach all day long if they'd have let me about how bad running was okay I was a defensive end I had to run three feet at most Right? If the quarterback scrambled, maybe a little bit more. Right? But if he got outside of me, I didn't do my job. I wasn't going to get another play anyway. Right? That's all I had to do. If I had to run more than three, somebody behind me didn't do their job. Right? So I argued, no, nah, I shouldn't have to run. Didn't work. Had to run. Hated running. Okay? That is not a tribulation. That's something to equip me to be able to go out and do what I'm supposed to be able to do. Okay, that might be a trial. That might just be a period of growth. Y'all ever heard of growing pains? You remember them? 
what was happening was good for you. You were growing, but at the time it hurt. That, those are trials. Tribulations are you've already been equipped, but now God wants to show how well equipped you really are. A tribulation is the world looks at it, or from the outside somebody looks at it and says, there is no way that person should be able to bear the load or do what it is that they're doing right now. You know why that's the objective? Because if they can't explain why I can do it, then the conversation shifts to, it's not me doing it. It's God. Tribulations are to get outside of what's possible for me so that God can step in and do what's impossible for me. Okay, keep that in mind. Because verse number 5 says, with a, which is, referring to tribulations and persecutions, a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God. So again, tribulations and persecutions are a token or a symbol. Okay, and manifest means what? Plainly visible. Okay, of the righteous judgment of God. Now, anybody going to stand here today and say that God's a bad judge? No, he's never got one wrong. Anybody going to stand here today and say that God isn't righteous? Because he's holy, which means he's righteous. Tribulations and persecutions are a manifest or plainly visible token, right, or symbol that your life has his seal of approval to it. Let's continue reading. That ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. You know what that manifest token of persecutions and tribulations shows? That in the eyes of God, because it's a righteous judgment, it's not what I'm saying, it's what God says on the situation, right, may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. Now, it's hard to believe that I'd ever be kind of worthy of anything. I know where God found me. Is he saying that I've been counted worthy of his son coming and dying for me? No, no man's worthy of that. He says that you're worthy of the kingdom of God. But what's the kingdom of God? That's heaven. That's new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. What's coming one of these days at the end of the book of Revelation? Why do I get to go to heaven? Because of my title. Now that title I didn't buy. But my title is that I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ. My title is that he's made me a king and a priest. My title is that I am a child of God. Why do I get to go to the kingdom of God? Because he made me a part of it. Now, I'll never be worthy of receiving all those things, but that's, that's already done. When God saved me, remember that we love the part of the Bible that to, if we're faithful to confess our sins, he's faithful to cleanse us and forgive us of all unrighteousness. To forgive means that it's as if it never happened. Once you got saved in the eyes of God, there was never a time that you were not a part of the kingdom of God. He doesn't remember what you were when you weren't a part of the family. All he remembers is that you're a part of the family. You've always been a part in the eyes of God. In the eyes of God, there was never a time where you weren't enough for God to be satisfied with because you're robed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You want to know why? No, you want to know how? we ought to live our life as if we belong in the kingdom of God because in the eyes of God we do there are no outsiders in God's family they said come unto me and I'll know why cast you out that means once you're in you're in there's nobody in the kingdom of God that's a fraud you only get in because he bought you and if he did the work he didn't botch it everybody that's in heaven is an original from Christ there's no duplicates, there's no counterfeits. You only get in if the blood was applied. But see, there's a difference of being a part of something and being worthy of something. 
Do we deserve to be in heaven? No, but we're already there. That's past the point. God doesn't see us as if we've ever been anything but a part of the kingdom of God. So the question is, how do we live like we're appreciative of it? When it says that persecutions and tribulations are manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that we may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. You know how you become worthy of something? You invest in it. You want to know why you get a paycheck? Because you're worthy of it. You've invested your time, effort, and energy, part of your life, into a company. Hopefully so that the company makes a profit. If you're giving your best and they're losing money, I don't know how much longer you're going to have a paycheck. Okay? But you invest of yourself and then you receive a payment because you're worthy. They gave you the opportunity. They made you a part of the company, but you invested. They could have made you a part of the company and you could have never showed up. You never would have got a paycheck. You have to invest. God made you a part of the kingdom of God. But when God looks at us, you know who he finds worthy of the kingdom of God? Those that did what his son did. They invested of themselves so that others could become a part of the kingdom. They take of themselves and they give it to the kingdom of God, even though they've never seen it. They've heard about it, but they've never seen a floor plan or a drawing they don't know what their position's going to be. They don't know where that mansion that God's promised to give them is going to be located at. It hadn't even entered into the heart of man what he's going to prepare for those that love him. We can't wrap our head around what it's going to be, but we believe that we're a part of it. So we've invested of ourselves. Right? Those that live the life that says, Lord, I'm laying up my treasures where my heart is, and my heart's where you are. Right? I'm not laying up wood, hay, and stubble down here. I want gold, silver, and precious gems invested in glory. I don't need to see the final fruit of my works. I just believe by faith that if I do what you tell me to do, that I'm going to bear fruit, that I will be fruitful. Because God doesn't make anything that's dead. If you continue in Him and you're alive, you're going to have fruit. Right, well, he says, verse number 5, the end of it, for which ye also suffered. The reason we suffer trials and persecution, tribulations, is because there's a benefit, there's a gain when it comes to the kingdom of God. God doesn't let you suffer persecutions or tribulations because he doesn't have anything better to do. God's not an evil taskmaster. Right? God allows everything to happen for a purpose. You're going through something because God's doing something with you. Using your life to bring glory and honor to his son and for the good of the kingdom of God. That's why he says that if you're experiencing tribulations and persecutions, it's not because you did anything wrong. It's the exact opposite. It's because the world's afraid of you and the devil's trying everything he can do to stop you. And God needs to show off what he's done in your life. I think I taught a lesson one time. On the only way to know whether something's a diamond is to test how hard it is against other stuff. Nowadays, they got little meters you can touch stuff with. But back in the day, if you had a diamond, you needed to know if it was a diamond. Diamonds are, sapphires are like right at a number nine scale on gemstones. Ten's the highest. Ten's a diamond. So if you need to know whether it's, because there are clear sapphires. If you want to figure out whether it's a clear sapphire or a diamond, you got to scratch one against the other. And that's not an easy process. Right? Cutting a diamond or polishing a diamond, that's not easy because it's the hardest thing in the world. You've got to have other diamonds to polish away and shine up, make, put on them facets that the ladies got, they all got their individual, just make one, and then that'd be good enough. Just one, no choices. We're going back to the Henry Ford model. Right? You can have any color you want as long as it's black. Okay? But, it's not easy to do that. It's very meticulous work. 
but you've got to have something as hard as a diamond to cut a diamond. Well, the world's throwing their diamonds at you, and God says, throw them at them. He's, he's tougher. Put them up against that grindstone with what you think is hard. You're going to find out that he's going to start eating away at what you thought was the toughest thing. And that's why back in the day they would bite on gold because it was so soft. That's how they knew it was real. You bite fool's gold pyrite, guess what? You're going to chip a tooth. But if it was gold, you would leave an imprint in it. Okay, We get to the point where we're so malleable that God leaves his imprint in us. You know how that happens? Pressure, time. We've got to go through the trials, the tribulations, and the persecutions so that when people inspect us, they see the image of Christ in us. Those things which are valuable, there's always a testing process to prove that it is what it is. That's what tribulations and persecutions are. It's God putting his seal of approval on your life and saying, this person will stand up to the heat. This person can weather whatever you throw at them. I'll remind you, did the devil name Job? No. God said, hast thou considered my servant Job? The devil already knew who Job was. He didn't have to think about it. He said, you blessed him too good. You've got a hedge so thick around him that I can't even touch him. God said, what if I took it away? Then the devil said, if you let me take everything that he's got, he'll curse you. God said, no, he won't. You can touch everything but his flesh. The first time. Then he said, you could have everything but his life. Those tri tribulations and those persecutions, they were hard. They were dark. Job said the thing that he feared most in life came upon him. That he looked to the north, south, east, west. He looked on every hand and he could not perceive God. The thing that he feared most in life is that he couldn't experience the presence of God in his life. He knew God was still there. He knew that God still knew where Job was. But the thing that he didn't know was that those persecutions, those tribulations, that was God's seal of approval that he was worthy of what God had done in his life. He had passed all the tests. He had been equipped properly. When it came to the way that Job lived, the princes of the kingdom came and talked to Job because they knew that Job walked with God. They knew that Job had a little bit of God's wisdom about him. When they got stumped, they went to Job. And what was Job? Job was just a farmer. He had a great big farm, and he had twice the farm that he had on the latter end of his life. But he was just a farmer. But yet the farmer would have princes come and visit him. Why? Because he was so close to God. Everybody thought, well, Job, God's blessed Job. But after Job lost everything, what did they think? Job did something wrong against God. Though he went through all the hardness to prove that all those things that he had said for years, they were true. They were a part of him. It was more than just talk. It was what was ingrained into his person. You know who sanctioned that? God did. Hast thou considered my servant Job? The devil was walking about. Chapter 1 of the book of Job says he was walking up and down, to and fro in the earth, seeking whom he could devour. As a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The devil's out there looking for somebody to destroy. God said, Hast thou considered my servant Job? God knew that the devil would be so distracted with Job that he couldn't destroy somebody else in the meantime. You ever realize that tribulations and persecutions in your life might be because God's using you to protect somebody else? That's a seal of approval from God. That you are strong enough to handle whatever's getting ready to come your way. Or else he wouldn't have let it come your way. You ever think, I don't know why it happened. First, let's say, in the book of Job, God said he can have everything but his life, so the devil afflicted Job's body with boils from head to toe. Right, well, when we go to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, where it says his blood was as great 
or his sweat was his great drops of blood. He's hemorrhaging in the garden. I know the devil is trying to kill him in the garden because if he can kill him, he's not God. But if Jesus lays down his life, the devil didn't kill him. He's trying to kill him in the garden. I don't know if he was hemorrhaging because of the amount of physical effort it took for him to withstand whatever the devil was throwing at him. Because I know that his body wasn't meant to hold all that holiness. Right? I know that the flesh that he had made for himself couldn't stand up to all the power of God. And I don't know if he's just on the line of flexing hard enough that he's about ready to shred everything underneath it, like the, the Lou Ferrigno hawk. He turned green and then the shirt shred. Or I don't know if God the Father permitted the devil to actually afflict the flesh of Christ to where it was hemorrhaging and pulling apart on itself. I don't know why, but I know that it was happening. I know that he was under enough load that the very flesh that he wore was getting ready to tear apart and split at the sink. It was giving up on itself. Hey Bryce, how you doing buddy? Don't know why it happened, but I know that he endured it. I've never had trials and tribulations that hard. But he says, into verse number 5, or sorry, into verse number 5, for which he also suffer. You know why it's a sign or a seal of approval that God is counting you worthy of the kingdom of God? Because of sufferings in your life? Because it was a sign that Jesus was who he said he was. There's no greater seal of approval in your life when God says you're enough like my son that you can become a partaker in the tribulations that he originally faced. You do realize that the apostles that died a martyr's death, they didn't even see fit to be crucified on a cross shaped the same way that Jesus' was. Andrew insisted that they lean his on the side. That's the cross that's on the flag of Scotland. That's not just an X, that's his cross because he refused to be crucified on a cross like Christ. He didn't think he was worthy. Reportedly, they crucified Peter upside down because he didn't see fit to be crucified in the same manner as Christ. Some were burned at the stake. They chose to be burned at the stake rather than crucified because they would not bring dishonor to the cross of Christ by hanging on one like it. Those are people that God counted worthy to take part in that tribulation, that persecution. To prove that what he put in them was real. Now I know we got a revival meeting coming up. And I know that today is a, meant to be a day of celebration. It's going to be a great celebration when we all start getting them seals of approval on our life from God. Revival is going to kick out when we all embrace the fact that in order to get that seal of approval, we might have to face some hardness. Now, when was the last time you prayed, Lord, what keeps me from being ready for persecution and tribulations? Most of the time we pray not to have tribulation and persecution. Not to have trials. That's not the way God intended it. You prove that you're real by what you're stronger than. I'm not stronger than anything. Arm of flesh is going to fail me. But you know what those two things that the Apostle Paul said he thanked God for in their lives that allowed them to overcome those tribulations and those persecutions? Faith and patience. Hard things to pray for. Now, the easy thing to pray for, hard thing to learn harder thing to live why did he praise he was rejoiced at why because their faith grew and they had such faith that they were willing to wait on God because they understood that this is happening because God has approved of what I have grown into in his son I am being persecuted because I am like Christ that's a seal of approval tribulation has come my way so that God can prove what's in me is real to everybody else out there. That's a seal of approval. If you want revival, start praying that God will make you worthy of tribulations and persecutions. 
Start asking, Lord, what keeps me from being prepared for tribulations and persecutions? Because it's His will that you be conformed to the image of His Son. What was the image of His Son? Someone that bore those things which nobody else could. How do we become like that? We bear tribulations and persecutions that outside of ourselves we would not be able to endure. Now that's it. We'll take a short break. Get ready for worship. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.